My name is Dan Keller. Um, my background is from uh, reaction diffusion, uh, specifically uh, working with M cell with Tom Bartol uh, and Terry Sanofsky uh, before I came to the Blue Brain. So, in this talk, I'll tell you a little bit about the column simulations, um, how those are set up, and also the building process that goes into creating the mesh models that we use for uh, our, our reaction diffusion simulations. Um, how we go about populating these mesh mo models with molecules, how we annotate the regions, and register the simulation in turn back with the, the larger macroscalar simulation. And so the important thing about uh, multiscalar modeling in the blue brain is that everything at a larger scale has a counterpart at uh, the most uh, reduced scale. And lastly, I'll tell you a little bit about the simulations that we've been performing. Okay, so <clears throat> in the laboratory, we have to characterize all the cells that go into creating um, a cortical column. We patch the cells and of course label them with dye, characterize them electrophysiologically, and perform histology um, on them then reconstructing their sections and segments with Neurolucida. Okay. Finally, when all is said and done, we have a morphological model uh, full of all the sections and segments. Uh, generally, there's about 300 um, segments per neuron uh, in the models that we use. Do you track the axon as well? Yes, we do track the axon, although those are not explicitly simulated, usually, uh, within the larger electrical simulation, um, just for uh, computational reasons. Now, there's a tremendous amount of morphological variation uh, that goes into the, the uh, cells in the column. Here's just um, a representative sampling of all the different cell types. And when we don't have um, good enough uh, reconstructions, we um, we go back to the lab and tell people to focus on this cell type and focus on, for example, getting more uh, axonal reconstructions of a particular um, cell type. So it's kind of an iterative process towards obtaining representative sampling of all of the um, cell types within the column. Now what do we do with these uh, morphologies once we've obtained them? Well, as uh, James um, mentioned, um, we use kind of similar process. We position these neurons uh, in space and they're rotated and, um, and, and placed um, at their um, correct uh, layers within the column. Okay. Now once we have the um, dendrites and axons, we do touch detection. That is to say, um, we detect that there's a proximal connection uh, proximity between a dendrite and an axon, and we place synapses at the point of intersection. And when all is said and done, we obtain a microcircuit um, with the complete connectivity of the circuit already in there, and we simulate these uh, in neuron on a supercomputer. Okay. Now, now that we have the circuit, we can build the subcellular features uh, that correspond to all of these. For example, synapses. We have to have the spines, including the postsynaptic density, or PSD, the boutons with the active zone, uh, the synaptic cleft, um, all the subcellular organelles, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and even the soma. So I'll tell you a little bit about the process that goes into this. Um, I've already talked to you a little bit about the light microscopy, and there's also a parallel EM track towards hmm, obtaining the uh, um, the finer features of these uh, subcellular structures. These all go into a uh, process that we call the ultrastructure builder, which um, after completion generates all the subcellular meshes that correspond to everything in the circuit. Um, these go into another builder which maps constraints, which maps molecular concentrations and reactions taken from the literature um, onto um, the meshes and builds models. These models being reaction diffusion models with um, M cell or steps. And, um, but we've attempted to keep the model as generic as possible and simulator agnostic, meaning that um, potentially we could support other simulators as well, for example, Smothine or, or what have you. Um, okay. So, right, the data from the morphologies um, goes to building the meshes, the surface meshes on the neurons. 
um, we take statistical representations of all these um, finer ultrastructure features to build the boutons, to build the spines, and then we have a process called the extracellular optimizer, which um, kind of moves things into place because what you get out of touch detection doesn't necessarily have the correct uh, distribution of spine distances and sometimes because we've just laid these morphologies on top of the, each other you can have processes that intersect each other so we need to kind of move all those guys apart uh, with the repulsive force field. Finally we put in the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, and build the soma. So maybe I'll just um, kind of start with different aspects. For the soma, we can um, place um, different organelles, the Golgi apparatus, the um, ER, and uh, the nucleus in there. Um, <clears throat> now, when we generate um, additional subcellular features, such as the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria, we generally save these in the same files as neuron meshes. And all of these are annotated, so we know um, um, their identity. Um, we don't necessarily maintain the registration problem, the registration with the original um, segments and sections, um, but when we, uh, in the final process, go to export this region of subcellular space, uh, we just use mesh Boolean operations to, um, to pull out uh, these structures. When we generate the ER, we know the probability that, um, so I should say the ER is a net-like structure. Um, that kind of permeates um, the whole of all the processes. So we know the probabilities that two different processes will um, intersect or diverge or converge um, and can use that uh, to kind of draw from this distribution to generate the ER. Um, same thing for the mitochondria. We know the numbers uh, per unit length of axon and their, um, their links that they generally uh, have. Now, so here's kind of a representative uh, picture of, of these meshes, uh, the red being a mitochondria and the white being an endoplasmic reticulum segment. Now, <clears throat> in um, excitatory neurons, of course, there's generally just one mitochondria that pervades uh, the whole of the structure, whereas in inhibitory neurons, there's actually many um, different uh, mitochondria. Okay, so we also put in the boutons. And it's kind of a similar process. We draw from statistical distributions so that we know the radius of the swelling that the boutons um, undergo. And then also remap and remesh uh, the active zone um, in order to place receptors later on in these uh, structures, okay? And of course, everything is parameterizable. When we go to create the spines, now, recall that um, out of touch detection, there's just the presence of the synapse that's noted, okay? And then you generally have um, a gulf, a gap to fill with the spine. Now, we have specialized tools and um, also the literature, um, originally we we're using mostly just literature, to create spines. And the parameters that we wanted to match were the neck radius, the um, spine volume, the head volume, um, it's the curvature, um, postsynaptic density area, and volume. Um, which of course is important for the strength of the synapse. Um, so we put these into the generator and came out with spines. Now we're moving towards um, using specialized tools, um, such as this one generated uh, by the Cajal Institute for us to actually sample spine morphologies from EM data sets um, in order to create this uh, library of different spines that we can draw from to populate our neurons. <laughs> okay, so we generally just um, at least uh, at this stage, just extract the radius as a function of uh, the length of the spine in order to generate them. <coughs> then we have to go back to our original morphologies and insert these new spines. Um, now, when we originally did the neurolucida for those morphologies, of course we kept the spine information, but it's no longer valid. The presence of the synapse is no longer valid once we did this uh, touch detection in order to, um, so we have to kind of regenerate them. Okay, now when we've added these new segments in the morphologies, that's not what's running in the um, macroscalar circuit simulation, okay? Um, what's running is actually a neuron without these spines in it. So we have to kind of maintain the registration and knowledge of our new um, uh, spine segments to the original morphologies. That said, we could conceivably simulate these um, 
as chemical compartments if we wanted to because they're now generated uh, in the morphologies. Okay, so what happens uh, uh, during this process? Well, I can specify any coordinate of any um, position within the column and pull out a cube um, of space. Uh, generally, of, of interest are the synapses. <clears throat> so when we export a synapse, we have to enforce the uh, cleft spacing. <clears throat> so I have a refinement step that enforces this 20 nanometer cleft uh, gap. Um, because, of course, that's relevant when you release uh, glutamate uh, into the synapse. Um, now, for now, I've um, assumed that the null space in, um, uh, in our cube, besides being occupied by axons and dendrites, um, the null space uh, will then be glial cells. Um, and we can make a mesh corresponding to those glial cells. Now, in this uh, diagram, what you see is a spine and the red is the PSD. And it, it's not just um, a surface region that we've tracked, but also the internal volume element seen at the very right corresponding to the PSD. And we maintain knowledge of all these structures so that later on we can map the chemical reactions into them. So I'd like to kind of reiterate um, uh, UPI's call for a new set of standards in defining um, the chemical reactions within a context of neurons because, and I'll give you some examples later on, because we've actually run up against uh, uh, some of these, I'd say, kind of deficiencies currently uh, in, uh, uh, in how, uh, in, in the current st set of standards. Okay, so we can produce neurons with a complete set of spines. Now, the interesting thing is um, now the um, spines are actually melded with the mesh. So the whole of the morphology is, the whole of the mesh is now watertight, um, um, a watertight compartment. And so that's very useful when, when conducting these reaction diffusion types of simulations uh, within the meshes. So how do you get, the, sorry, how do you get them to be watertight? Oh, well, it was actually quite an ordeal to generate these meshes. Um, so is this automated or is it by hand? No, it is fully automated. It is automated. Yeah, so it was, um, um, it's kind of a massive piece of code that goes and does that. No, it's a hard problem. Right? Yeah. Yeah, there were many, because uh, there's so many special cases mm -hmm. within the data that you have to just go through um, and kind of do it the hard way just by waiting to encounter a special case, and then just going back and solving that problem. But I think now we have a salt, we can mesh 30,000 neurons in the typical number in a column uh, without any errors being um, um, encountered. So I think so, we So just to be sure, what you think as input is uh, Neurolucida or EM reconstruction data, and you just give it, give it the, you know, the, the crude topology of the neuron, and then it, it makes water type. Yes, that's correct. So we're also working um, as the next step um, to synthesize glial cells. And I told you how we're taking the null space before to just kind of create a crude mesh upon which we can map um, surface reactions. But it'd be nice if we actually had the glial cells fully represented within the context of this model. So what we do um, in collaboration with uh, Graham Knott is uh, we have these filled glial cells and we've uh, done serial um, EM on them, and we're also pulling out the statistics of their branching, surface area, um, things like that, in order to actually grow and synthesize new glial cells that will be laid down after everybody else is placed, and laid down in such a way that they don't intersect any pre-existing neurons. Um, of course, we will always still have this additional morphological refinement step in which we kind of massage the meshes to, to have the correct um, extracellular gap and spacing uh, between them. Right, and that's actually what we call the extracellular optimizer. Um, <clears throat> in order to get the synapses correct, we have these um, springs that we have to attach between your presynaptic and postsynaptic segments to kind of move the um, segments into close opposition to each other. And during this stage, what we get for free um, by attaching the right set of uh, constraints is actually we can move some that might otherwise overlap um, so they don't overlap anymore. Okay. So the goal is to create a neuropill that's completely filled with um, 
um, with mesh elements, as is real tissue. And here's just kind of um, a um, demonstration of, um, of um, an earlier version of the model in which we were just putting in spines. Now, of course, the spines are actually grown as part of the, um, um, as part of the meshing process. Um, and this way, I'm just kind of um, sprinkling them on here in this uh, visualization. And of course, here's the uh, soma. Um, and <clears throat> then we're going to just kind of fly along the uh, dendrite to look at a synapse of interest. Oh yes, of course, um, our endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria uh, in this one. Um, there are still cases in which there's close apposition of the endoplasmic reticulum mitochondria as well as the spine apparatus that I still have to kind of refine to make the spine apparatus stick through into the interior of the spines. And then we'll just kind of zoom in on a, um, on a spine and synapse, of course, now with the correct um, spacing. So I'll just kind of proceed. Okay. Yeah, so as I told you now, we can actually um, do random access and, and cut out our tissue. Um, these annotated simulations are what goes into the molecular simulators. And we have to track all their correspondence to the original electrical simulation so that we can map the voltages on, of the electrical simulation onto the channels in our mesh models uh, in order to get um, the proper amount of current flow that goes in and drives events in those membranes. Now currently, <clears throat> it's kind of a one-way street. We haven't closed the link back from the um, fine level reaction diffusion levels to the electrical simulation. And um, so it's basically just the voltages driving the uh, reaction diffusion simulations. Um, there's a number of computational constraints, of course, involved in doing that. And you should be aware that the time scale for simulating these um, detailed simulations is actually much longer than the time scale for simulating the corresponding amount of time with just an electrical simulation. So that's a gap which I think um, uh, will be difficult to surmount. So it'll never be possible to run an entire brain or entire column at full molecular um, scale. You'll always have to, if you choose to run them concurrently, um, choose to run a very small amount of tissue in conjunction um, with the full column at this uh, level of resolution. Are yes? you using MSO? No, in fact, um, one of the other simulators that we uh, can export to is, is STEPS. So I, I, don't, I don't think that we should um, be tied to a particular simulator. Well, actually, I meant it in a even more general sense, that you're, you seem to have picked a very, very highly geometrically detailed uh, version of the chemistry. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for many purposes, you might even consider going down to a further level of, of coarseness in your resolution mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm going to treat it as compartments, uh, you know, one compartment for ESD, one for... Sure. I think that's actually a, a good way because much of what I've shown you now is in, in some sense computational overkill, right? Do we really need a, a finely meshed uh, endoplasmic particulum with this fine level of detail? Well, I suspect not. I suspect actually that you could get by with just having the correct surface area and some kind of volume element maybe um, in a much simpler simulation. But how do you show this? And I think the correct way to show it is to actually have both scales of simulation and show, okay, for this particular feature, space does not matter so much. We don't need this much detail. Now there will be instances in which space matters incredibly. And uh, I, I think this, um, this approach towards having multiple representations at different levels of coarseness will allow us to properly assess uh, just when we need a, a particular level of detail. Okay, so now I'll talk to you about populating these meshes with molecules. Uh, we currently have a database of concentrations and reactions. Um, of all the molecules in the um, uh, spine. Now, we don't tie these to compartments. Some um, model languages do tie these to compartments, but it actually is a little bit cleaner if you don't. Um, users um, should also be able to register different models corresponding to the same molecule. For example, paper A has one model of the same molecule as paper B, but they do it in slightly different ways. Um, what we um, are working on is a way to check the constraints um, so that these models are all interoperable. Oh, 
Did you have a? What do you mean that reactions are not tied to compartments? OK. So um, in, um, in some languages, you have to have a, a molecule within a certain compartment uh, undergoing um, a reaction with another molecule within that same compartment. And that compartment itself is specified as part of the um, reaction. That's what I mean. Um, whereas um, you could imagine that you might be able to just take the molecules out and not have them um, linked in any way to the compartment they're undergoing uh, the reaction in. And I think that makes it a little bit easier to, to port molecular models across compartments. <coughs> and yes. Are you referring to the STML? Well, okay, yes, that would be an example. Because that's a relatively easy mapping to... Yeah, it's, it's not insurmountable, it's really actually... For this model, uh, you know, compartment X happens to represent dendrite. For this model, it happens compartment Y happens to represent dendrite, and so on. I mean, it's yeah, it's not too it's not too hard to, um, but I, I, I but I but it, it makes it makes it a little nicer if um, if you don't have them tied uh, like that. But well, yeah, except that in some models, in many models, I would argue, the compartmentalization is a key part of the chemistry. So. You do want to say that certain reactions happen in this context and other reactions happen elsewhere. For sure, but that, that um, linking should happen at the point at which you map the molecules onto the compartments. But the modeler has already done that for you. Um, the, re the modeler, he or she has already said that these reactions are happening in the dendrite and these reactions are happening in the spine. Mm -hmm. What was their compartmentalization? Yeah, and it, 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 clearly the information is there and they can cross talk to each other. Um, yeah, so they have, and they've, they've done some of this, so it seems a, a shame not to be using that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's certainly um, not, a, not a huge one. So, so I'm curious, you're using, uh, you've taken models, say from biomodels or docs or somewhere, mm -hmm. and you've already massaged them into this database form. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Let's see. Is there any particular reason why you don't want to just take the original models? Well, the thing about, let's say, biomodels, for example, is that you can't just pluck uh, one molecule or one, uh, one model uh, of a molecule and expect it to talk to another one that you've also taken from biomodels. So I think it'd be nice if there were a set of standards that um, could kind of enforce interoperability uh, between um, those models. No, those are those are also um, possible to use uh, as well. Um, I thought we were talking about just the biomodels uh, uh, database. Okay, so <clears throat> another thing is we'd like to be able to um, have a good naming scheme for um, the. Um, well, okay. Besides, uh, so I just mentioned that point. Um, well, another issue we've, we've come across uh, in, in the project is that an ion channel to an electrophysiologist doesn't necessarily correspond to what it, um, to the same structure that a molecular biologist would see, right? Because you have different subunit compositions. So I think we also need rules to map these um, uh, entities onto, um, uh, to make them cross talk to each other. Okay, so the current regions in um, are simulations that we can annotate. Um, I've made a list of them, um, but of course there, there's others. And I think what we need are consistent um, region names that map, um, that actually have entity, that actually have correspondence at another um, kind of uh, level of simulation. So for example, the PSD um, might have a correspondence with the um, um, PSD at a higher level um, because that's where all the conductances are. So I've talked to you about um, the fact that it's a one-way street from the electrical simulations to the, um, uh, to the molecule simulations. We'd like to one day conduct, connect these back together. Um, we'll never be able to run these at the same um, level of detail for the entire column, but it might be possible 
to construct lookup tables uh, for a given set of uh, input stimuli, stereotyped stimuli, um, and then be able to rapidly reference these lookup tables in um, a larger scale simulation to understand what a synapse does, for example. Okay, so <clears throat> what you see here is an active zone that I've remeshed onto um, the surface of a, uh, um, an axon. And in the interior is a simulation of uh, calcium, the white dots, um, kind of surrounding one of the vesicles in there. So we can get an idea of the probability of release of that vesicle um, in response to calcium influx. What we'd like to be able to do in um, in any standardized representation is to be able to track and specify the constellation of um, channels that you might see in dots in this left figure with the um, positions of the vesicles seen as circles uh, in this diagram. And you can imagine that their distribution might be um, written as a set of uh, constraint equations, um, which should also, I think, be tracked in any specification of uh, the chemistry. And on the right, you see a simulation of uh, the calcium influx uh, uh, that occurs when these channels are uh, activated. Okay, so I've talked to you about the subcellular simulations. In conjunction with that are the extracellular simulations. So what we're um, working to do is superimpose a grid of voxel elements um, over the column. Now, the subcellular simulations are in the order of um, maybe let's say on the order of microns, but these coarser grained uh, voxels which map over the column are on the order of tens of microns. And we can model these as single compartments into which we can um, um, inject or remove ions uh, depending on the activity of the neuronal segments within each of the voxels. And then track the diffusion between these voxel elements um, now this is a desirable for a number of, of reasons, as uh, we've touched upon in earlier talks, um, most particularly in linking in the glial cell contribution to the extracellular environment that the neurons experience. And then we can go ahead, um, once we know the changed um, ion concentrations and remap these ion concentrations extracellularly to the reversal potential experienced by each of the segments uh, in the neuron simulations. Okay, so here's this kind of diagram showing that process. You have your subcellular domain with the spine, some glia, and, and uh, axon, um, the extracellular simulations, the, this grid of uh, voxels is, um, is mapping to that and giving that information about their ex extracellular ionic concentrations. Meanwhile, both entities are exchanging information with the column simulations. All right. So, <clears throat> just to summarize, we can now export um, any cubic region of neuropil to these molecular simulations. Um, I think we do need a set of um, common standards in order to exchange information um, about um, these neural mo neuronal modules, including um, a set of standardized subcellular regions, um, molecule and multimeric um, complex names, and models that correspond to each of those molecules. Now, um, currently, we drive these simulations with the electrical activity of the network. Um, they do run in, at a different time scale than the main cortical column, right? Um, because for molecular simulations, you often need a much finer time scale uh, than um, you can get by with for the electrical simulations. <coughs> and um, I think there will occur um, um, cases in which we'd want to be able to simulate both of these levels, um, the electrical simulation and the subcellular simulations uh, simultaneously. So that will actually help validate uh, uh, the approach. So thanks for your attention. Uh, questions? <laughs> oh, yes. I should also um, acknowledge that we do exist within a larger ecosystem of people mostly focused on uh, uh, the circuit simulations, um, and thanks in particular to the INCF, uh, Sean Hill, Eric, and uh, Matthew Abrams for, uh, for having me.